Okay, guys, uh, this is the second part of the lecture on the installation of metal cables. And what we're going to do is go back in touch once again on pull tension. Now, what this formula is used for is this is used if you don't, if the pull tension for the cable uh, that you're working in is not specified. A lot of the communication cables, it's already specified, but we'll go back and look at this. Uh, I think we also looked at pull, uh, lubrication, and I'll try to show you all some of this, too. Uh, here's pull tension. So this is a little better one that I found on the uh, Internet that explains it a little better. And then I'll give you access to actually a uh, Excel spreadsheet uh, that basically does all the calculations for you. And all you have to do is just enter some information. But if we're using a single conductor, now this is the... Uh, uh, what each one of these abbreviations stand for, even uh, on all these different formulas. Uh, so a single co uh, co uh, conductor, your tension would be equal to your uh, pounds per circular meal. And this is in ta the next table. I'm going to go ahead and uh, make this full screen to make it a little easier to do. So it's your uh, max, and then uh, then this would be the C meals, not the KC meals, but C meals, and we'll look at that. Basically, it's K mils times a thousand more, but they they have a table that helps us out. So uh, let's go back and look at uh, table one. Uh, so here's table one, and this is the uh, sorry, uh, this is this one right here. So it's S, which is pounds per circular mil table one, and then uh, we'll look at that, and then the K uh, K C mils. So what we do is we come over here. And if we're going to pull a certain conductor, this starts at, uh, unfortunately, this only goes down to size 12, or uh, AW, uh, the American wire gauge size 12. And then it goes up to 1,000 KC uh, mils. Uh, and these are pretty standard sizes right here. So if I was going to pull a 12 gauge wire, then what we would use is this would be the C mil that we would use. And then this would be all your copper this would be your pounds per circle mils that you would use uh so <laughs> if you're pulling over a single conductor then odds are this would be the formula you use three or more under more three you would do this one uh, uh three or more you'd use this this calculation right here uh but let's look at this we'll plug some numbers in here so we're going to do a uh, single a single copper cable so uh, since we're doing a single copper cable then we uh, use uh, this measurement right here all coppers 0 0.008 and then over here uh, i think we're using 12 gauge wire so 12 gauge wire we use 65 6530 for the c mills which is basically the kc mills times a thousand really so i'd come back here and look at this so that means for 12 gauge wire, a single copper conductor, our pull tension would be a would be less than this. Actually, you don't want to pull at this, but it would be less than that. Now this is 250 kc mils with five conductors, which would be a really really big cable. Uh, 250 kc mils has a uh, outside diameter of a half inch. Uh, so here we would. Uh, five conductors so five conductors what we would do uh, let me go back to the formulas uh, where were they at here we go so five conductors uh, we use 0.8 as a standard n would be the number of conductors in the cable and this would be the c mill with more than one conductor uh, so what this would turn up in be this would be 200 for kc mills five conductor cable would be uh, 0.8 uh, times the, uh, the weight per pound, and then this would be the C mills. So that means we could pull this big old cable at a thousand pounds. Uh, another thing that I wanted to show you, and let me go ahead and go to it now, is what I found on the internet. Is there are several. Uh, there are several uh, sites up there that has a calculator involved in it. Uh, so what I've done here is I'm going to just go to the Blackboard site and inside 
course condense and then in reference material what I've done is I've uploaded your uh, pull tension calculator right here and even though it looks kind of <clears throat> even though it looks kind of intimidating Uh, so here it is right here. So basically we would do about the same thing. So up here, I already have it in here. We're pulling five wires of 250 kc mil. So this is where you type in the number of wires. This would you type in your number of kc mils. And this would give you the outside diameter of the wire. Uh, and then this right here would give you the wire weight per foot. Uh, then we would come up here. And you see the pull tension would be about 8,000 pounds. With this sidewall pressure, jam probability would be very small for this size cable. So this is a pretty neat unit, and we could add a lot more to it, but I just wanted to show you all this. This is available. I showed you how to get to it uh, if you ever have to pull some sure enough, uh, sure enough cable. Uh, when we get into communication cables, though, <clears throat> since these are standard sizes and standard gauges, and uh, what we can uh, uh, what we can do is we can actually look these pull tensions up. <clears throat> and we've already talked about this bin radius. Uh, we'll look at some of these too. So this is uh, the bin radius for Cat5 cable would be if you got run one cat5 cable which has eight conductors then you take the outside uh outside jacket diameter and multiply it by four and this would be your uh your bin radius uh and this would be your minimum uh, if you're using uh utp cable that has multiple conductors like a premise cable or something like that and it's going to be 10 times the diameter and coaxial cable which we looked at was that would be 10 times the diameter uh, the bin radius for for uh, fiber optics is a little different. Uh, we have we have a bin radius when we're installing it, and then we have a bin radius we have we should not exceed uh, when uh, when it's actually installed. So this would be while you're installing it. This would be after it's installed. So uh, interconnect cables, which is basically cables that run from from point to point, uh, single single or, or double conductor cables are are uh, are uh, interconnect with. I mean, are install. We could do two inches, and then the long term we could use one inch. Uh, all your premise cables. These are cables within the premise, and these are going to show. We're going to look at this when we get into fiber optics uh, about the different uh, different types of arrangements you can buy these cable true cables. Uh, we have conductors, and then a lot of your fiber optic uh, conductors are embedded in a lot of layers of uh, uh, layers of protection. And we talked about this. So, cable, the term cable is used uh, two different meanings. It could be a uh, two or more conductors inside a common jacket, or it could be a single conductor that has multiple layers of protection to it. Uh, so we have uh, single conductor cables uh, that we'll look at, and then premise cables are going to be multiple conductors cables, and we'll look at this when we get in here. But this would be the maximum pull diameter, and like I said, these guys have been around, and they're they're standard sizes. So instead of punching these into a chart, uh, then these are usually uh, usually given for you or available on the, through the internet. Uh, just type in interconnect or bend radius and pull tensions uh, these are your pull tensions here for uh, cat 5 or cat 6 a maximum a maximum of 25 pounds so you should say less than 25 pounds rg59 which is what's used in uh, cable tv inside premise inside your your house or uh, once it comes down off the telephone pole we use uh, rg RGU, but most people call this RG59. This is 40 pounds. 
uh, fiber optic interconnect, this would be from computer to computer or computer to switch or whatever, is a 50 pounds, uh, minimum uh, uh, less than 50 pounds. Optical primer premium uh, uh, plenum, and we talked a little bit about the plenum was. So the plenum is the uh, is the space between a suspended ceiling and a uh, and the actual true ceiling. Uh, if you're pulling less than 12 power uh, fibers. Uh, then that would be, uh, now this is not a conductor, this would be a cable uh, that's got Kevlar and all that other kind of stuff in it that we, uh, we could pull with. 100 pounds, plenum would be 150. Uh, a riser, uh, riser cables, these would be your full tension on those. Uh, of course, we need to avoid deforming the cable when mounting hardware. Keep communication cable away from electromagnetic interference. And we've got another chart that's coming up. Keep the conduit field to 50% or lower and then avoid splices. Uh, so this is your recommended separation between these uh, power lines. So unshielded, these are all shielded. They say you can recommend it unshielded, but if we're running at less than 200 kilovolt amperes, uh, then we need to keep it at least, at least, uh, I don't know. I need to go back. To, I don't. I guess this is speed, guys. I need to go back and check that. But I'll go back and check that and, and let you know. Uh, undoubtedly, I didn't put that down. Uh, next thing we're going to look at is different ways we can splice. We've already looked at one solder, so we're not going to touch on that. We had a no lecture on that. Uh, we have twist-on connectors. We have bolt-on connectors. We have crimp connectors and compression connectors. Uh, so the first thing we're going to look on is your twist-on connector. Uh, these are the connectors that we use a lot in residential and commercial wiring. In fact, uh, what we usually refer to these, the, the, the trade name for these, because they twist on like a, a, a nut on a screw. Uh, so we call the, the uh, commercial name for these is wire nuts. And now these either have springs in them, these are the best ones, and then they're round in a certain way, which creates a, a, a basically a screw. And what we do is we come in, we put our wires in there, we twist them together, and I will show y'all that. I think we got another slide on that. And then, uh, so we don't use the wire nut to make the connection. What we do is we'll we'll come up here uh, with our two conductors, and then what we'll do is we'll cross them. And this is going to be house wiring, so uh, these are used uh, all over the place. We'll take a look at the different colors right here. Uh, and then what you do is you get a pair of needle nose pliers, but we usually use a pair of Lyman's pliers, and then we twist these together. Uh, so what we end up with is we end up with a nice uh, spiraled uh, uh, wire. And we, if we twist these, we twist these in a counter a clockwise direction. And then these are wired the other one, and then we literally just screw these things on there. So what we want to make sure we do, I see a lot of people that will just come up and put the wires together like this, and then they'll put the wire nut on there and they screw it down. That's not the proper way to do it. So there you're having the wire not only make the mechanical connection, you're also having to make uh, the, the physical or the electrical connection, you're also making it make the mechanical connection. What we want to do is we want to twist these wires uh, apart, twist them up, and then screw the wire nut down on there. Of course, you can see we have absolutely no exposed conductor coming out of the wire nut. And then we'll show you another little trick uh, later on, too. Uh, these are the different gauges, and we can get these different colors. And the, and the colors uh, tell us exactly what we can do. But this is kind of misleading. So what I've got, and uh, this is also available on the Internet, and it's also available up on the website is when you run multiple conductors. So this would be from for 10 to 2, uh, 14 to 10, but these would be only if you uh, use two conductors. And by the way, these guys are normally used for solid conductors, solid strain. Um, usually stranded, we use some type of compression. I have seen people do that, but you got to uh, use these on stranded. But these are predominantly used for or a solid conductor. Uh, so these are wire nut sizes, so I'm just going to clip on the link. And like I said, 
this is also available uh, on our on uh, the Blackboard site. And I'll show you where it's at in a second. So these are what you can do with these things. And what they do is they come up and give us uh, the different the, ter the different wire nuts that we can have. So if I've got an orange, that means I could put five number 22s. I could put three number 20s. I could put two. I could put one this, one that. So what this does is actually tell you the different wire arrangements that you can put inside these different size wire nuts. Uh, the one we're going to be using is a the one we're going to be using is a yellow and we're going to be doing <coughs> here we go so this is what we're going to do uh, with ours so ours is set up to do two 18s two fours so two fours And we're going to use two number 14s. Uh, so this is what we'll use. We'll use a yellow wire nut. This information, if you buy the wire nuts in a in a container, it usually gives you the this right here. But this is a really good handout if you want to do that. Okay, guys, this is a YouTube video on using wire nuts. I just found it, so let's go ahead and do this. Hey, everybody. I'm here today to show you how to connect electrical wires together. So as you can see right here, I have two sets of electrical wires and there is a black, a white and an uninsulated wire on each. And in most cases, this is what you will encounter. So for the purposes of this video, I will be working with these two wires, which once again have a black wire, a white wire and an uninsulated wire on each. So the first step is to connect the black wires. Now these are um, the hot wires. They're the ones, the power wires basically. So we're going to get the two wires together just like that. Make sure that they are stripped properly, that you have enough of the actual wire. <clears throat> and we're going to place them together. Then you're going to get a pair of pliers and simply twist them in a clockwise motion just like that just like that and once you see that they are twisted together and I'll just bring it a little bit closer to the camera then you can take a wire connector just like this and place it over top of them and twist the wire connector clockwise just like that that is done once the wire connector is on there fully you are finished with that now we're going to take the two white wires and we're going to do the same thing so as you can see I have the two white wires just like that I um, I'm pushing them together now I'm going to get a pair of pliers and I'm going to twist them together just like that in a clockwise motion until they are fully fully connected and secured just like that right there okay and once again I'm gonna bring it close up just so that you can see I'm gonna take the wire connector and simply twist it on just like that and the last and final step is to take the two um, uninsulated wires, the ground wires. Oh, and I forgot to mention, by the way, that the white wires are the neutral wires. So now we're going to take the uninsulated wires and do the exact same thing. We're going to just line them up properly, just like that. Get the pliers and twist them, just like that, clockwise. And now we can take our wire connector and twist it on. And that's it. That is how you connect electrical wires together. And that's all I have for you today. Thanks for watching. Hey, everybody. Hey. Okay, that's one example. And uh, <laughs> what we'll do also is we'll, we'll look at things on, in class when we get back and I'll show y'all some other techniques. There's a few little things that he did not do exactly right. 
uh, but he did it pretty good. And what we have to understand is that we have to choose the right wire nut depending on what gauge wires we're wrapping together. By the way, if you do use stranded wire, you need to make sure you tighten it or, or twist it uh, to twist the strands real tight uh, with your hands before you try to uh, use the wire nuts. These guys are predominantly used for uh, solid strand wire, but a lot of things that you buy, uh, such as ceiling fans and stuff like that, uh, these only come with uh, stranded wire. And these are what we call compression, uh, pressure or compression uh, splices. And uh, what's nice about compression uh, splices, these guys work really, really, really well with stranded wire. And why they work real well with stranded wire is that the uh, the strands go into this compression and they have no, they can't bird cage. I mean, they're all going to go in there, so don't change uh, with the wire. So these type of mechanical splices, these are used predominantly with stranded wires. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to use, uh, and we'll look at some compression uh, uh, terminals and stuff that's on the manufacturing lines over there uh, to show you uh, how those work. Uh, compression uh, uh, terminals are used a lot for uh, PLCs because they don't know what type of wire you're going to bring into it. Uh, and also a lot of, some of your newer terminal boards use compression instead of uh, instead of using screw terminals. Uh, so this is a uh, these are uh, crimp splices, and our crimp splices. Uh, let's see, I think we have a video there. So hold on. So I've uploaded or linked a bunch of videos. I uh, found out it's a lot easier to link them into YouTube than it is to try to put them in there. For one thing, with YouTube, you can actually adjust the size of the video. So these are going to be inside course content. And then when you get inside course content, uh, you notice down at the very bottom, these are videos. And uh, here we go, this in copper. These are generic, uh, these are pulling cables, and these could either be fiber cables or they could be, uh, or they could be copper cables using a vacuum. Uh, by the way, I found out, uh, the book calls it a vacuum of pressure, but you'll find these uh, easier if you, if you put blowing instead of that. I just, found that out. But inside copper, uh, here we have a video on our crimp terminals. Welcome to Galco TV. Today I will demonstrate how to crimp wires. Crimping means to join two pieces of metal together by deforming one or both of them to hold the other. The resulting deformity is what is known as the crimp. In order to crimp connectors onto a wire, you will need a dedicated crimping tool. Note that tools not dedicated to crimping, such as pliers, should not be used as they will not create the proper cold weld that a crimping specific tool will. A poor crimp can leave air pockets between the wire and connector. These air pockets can allow moisture to collect, resulting in eventual corrosion and ultimately leading to connection failure. You may need to strip away part of the insulation at the end of the wire before you can begin the crimping process. To do so, place the end of the wire into the proper hole of your stripping tool, ensuring that you will have enough exposed wire to fit your desired connector. Then clamp down and pull the insulation away to reveal the bare wire inside. Now that you have the end of the wire exposed, twist it with your thumb and finger to make the end more firm and to allow for a more positive connection for the connector. Proceed to insert the wire into the connector until the insulation on the wire touches the end of the barrel. Then insert the wire and terminal into the crimper. If your crimping tool features colored markings, match the insulation with the color on your crimping tool. If the crimping tool does not have colored markings, you will want to use the gauge markings on the side of the tool. Then, 
Squeeze the tool with considerable force. After completing the crimp, the wire and connector should remain held together even under force. If the connection can be pulled apart by hand, then the crimp was done improperly. It is preferable to have the crimp fail at this point rather than after being installed, so it is recommended to test before implementing. For more on wires and thousands of other products and services, head over to galco.com. Uh, she did a really good job with that. Uh, like I said, and we'll look at more of this too as far as the, the levels go. By the way, I, I think you probably noticed uh, the color. Uh, similar to wire nuts, we have a color code for uh, for our crimp splices too. Our crimp splices and uh, strip ter uh, crimp terminals. So we have what we refer to as butt splices. And this is because you push the, the conductors in and they literally butt it butt up against each other. Okay. These will be solder. We're going to put one of these guys on using the solder method. Uh, these would be your uh, crimp splices. Uh, normally they're covered with a insulating material and on that, that insulating material on the outside of the splice, uh, it will be color coded depending on what gauge wires uh, you can place in, or you should place into the spice. And you need to use the right color for the wires that you are splicing together. Uh, of course, you can twist wires together and, and uh, uh, add their diameters out and actually uh, uh, put multiple wires into these things. Uh, but when we go to uh, 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 Blackboard, and then we'll go back to out of videos and go back to uh, uh, reference material. And then hopefully we have a color code for uh, crimp splices in here. And here's pull tension, cable manual, insulation, wire nut, and fills. That's what we just looked at a while ago. Alter splices. Oh, that's the color code for network cables. Uh, mm, I don't see it, so let me pause this. This is a a, a cell site that I, I found. Uh, it's called All Wire, but I'll get that chart and and get it up there as soon as I can inside the reference. I thought I know I got one somewhere. It's just I hadn't uploaded yet. Uh, these are non-insulated uh, terminals, so that's not what we're interested in. So we're down here under these codes. So these are terminals, but if we get down into, uh, if we got down into butt splices, we'd see that the color code also matched. So this says us that the red can handle between a 22 and an 18 gauge wire. A yellow could be between a 12 and a 10. A blue would be a 16 to 14. There's red again, yellow again, and we do have a transparent, by the way, but I don't see uh, this company uh, selling that. Uh, we have push terminals, we have uh, slide-on terminals, uh, we have angle terminals, uh, but notice uh, no matter which one, when we get into the color code for the different colors, uh, the wire gauges uh, are the same. You know, we'll look and see. Uh, so the the splices are called butt splices because we actually uh, just butt push them into the to the end and actually uh, butt the two together. And uh, Like everything now. So these are butt splices right here. Unfortunately, this is the only one they show, uh, and this don't show us the gauge wire on here. So I'll have to look at it. But it's the same as the red for the terminal. 
So the color code is a standard color code for these insulated uh, uh, splices and uh, and also these terminals. And like I said, I'll find that and see if I can uh, get it up on the uh, internet where y'all can get those. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, this is uh, splicing with a compression connector. These are actually pressed or crimped into place, and these are these are for really really high gauge uh, or big gauge, big conductors. Uh, probably you know anything above, uh, especially in your art range or your KC mill range. These splices uh, are actually spliced with uh, special tools. You know, so in fact, I can I know where that is, but uh, let's look at compression tools. Uh, so we'll come up here and actually uh, look at them uh, performing a splice. So basically, these are crimped, but they're going to come in and use a really, really large uh, compression tool. Some of them are actually hydraulic uh, that actually crimps this down onto the actual connector. Uh, by the way, uh, if you notice, uh, here comes this insulator. You notice it's tapered down. And why they taper down is that if you have a straight vertical line, and this is referred to as penciling, if you have a straight vertical line, then the uh, instead of being equalized as it goes down, then your uh, magnetic field would come straight up and extend out further. But if we pencil down, what happens is this reduces the effects on the electrostatic. So here's the compression tool. And this is what they're doing. So this would actually be the splice. So it's basically a, a copper or a uh, or copper with tin or nickel plating on it to help it not oxidize. And then you just literally pump these things down or they have extremely long handles on them and you actually crimp them down that way. But they refer to these as uh, as compression. Uh, this is terminating uh, uh, a, a, a high voltage cable. And we looked at the makeup of a high voltage cable way back here, or even a medium voltage cable, where they go through different layers to equalize the stress uh, on the cable itself. So this is the makeup of a standard medium and a high voltage cable where they have several layers. When we talked about conduit, like I said, we'll go over to the uh, over to the uh, electrical lab in A208. You know, we'll let y'all look at some of this. Now, this is installation, but the uh, the actual makeup of the cable that uh, is in the last uh, PowerPoint. Well, we know uh, these cables, these medium voltage cables, have a have a cable that has an insulating, and then it has a semiconductor label uh, a, a layer to equalize the space, and then it has a uh, an insulator, then it has another uh, semiconductor layer, and then it might have another insulating layer, then it might have some strain relief layer, uh, then it's going to have a shield out there to help equalize the, spa uh, the stress, and all these different layers of the cable have to be completed. So we'll show you all this video of them uh, doing it two methods. Uh, the video, one method they're going to use is a 3M. 3M uh, does a lot of uh, high voltage termination, and they, they provide these kits that you can use to uh, terminate these high voltage cables. Unfortunately, they're very expensive. So what I'm going to do is show you the video, and I'll show them do this. And, uh, so, uh, so we'll go over to Blackboard. And it looks like I closed the blackboard out. So here you go. And then we'll go back to course content and go down to videos. The video we're going to look at is called uh, in copper. Uh, the video we're looking at is called heat shrink versus cold splice, which are 3M. So well, they're going to show you doing this at the same time. And 
this is a neat video. So these are two ways that we can splice uh, medium voltage and high voltage cable. And what's neat is you watch them rebuild uh, all these uh, all these different layers. Three amp standard cold shrink tape electrode joint offers a viable cost-based alternative to heat shrink cable jointing technology and allows for a reduction in installation steps. Unlike heat shrink alternatives, a molecular permanent set ensures constant radial pressure is exerted on the cable for the duration of the cable joint's life. Unlike the individual layers that are necessary for a heat shrink joint, which must be allowed to cool sufficiently before the next layer can be applied, 3M cold shrink splice bodies contain all the necessary layers in one component. Any additional cold shrink layers, such as our outer protection tube, can be applied immediately. Scotch 13 semiconducting tape is used to overtake the connector. Layers are applied tightly around the connector, overlapping the primary insulation on each side. This stage replaces the need for a heat shrink tube used in competitive heat applied alternatives. 3M invented cold shrink technology over 30 years ago. Our cold applied products utilise the unique cold shrink delivery system designed to make cable jointing, insulating, termination and abandonment as simple as possible. Compared to heat shrink alternatives there is less chance of damaging XLPE cable material, less room for jointer error and no cooling time needed before energising. It is easier to use in enclosed areas and there is no requirement for special site permits. In a number of applications, time-saving benefits of cold shrink can be considerable, thus lowering the overall installation cost. Additionally, many of the joint bodies are comprehensively factory tested before released, something simply not possible with heat shrink due to its material nature. Finally, as a result of continuous development and refinement, only 3M can offer you such choice in cold shrink technology in terms of product cost and flexibility in its application.
Uh, that was a, uh, that was uh, the procedure they go to, and you saw while they was doing that, uh, they literally came out and they rebuilt that cable uh, just to splice it. All your semiconductor labor, layers, all your insulating layers. Uh, I don't know if you noticed, but even the tape that they had to use when they went across the splice was a special semiconductor layer tape uh, that they came back and redid that with. And you can imagine how expensive those splices are. But uh, the compression that they used was not a crimp type correct uh, compression. It was actually bolted on, and it's pretty neat because uh, they have a uh, the the nuts that you actually tighten it down with actually break off when you get the right tension, and then they filled it in with a with an insulating putty, uh, which was really really neat. So uh, most of y'all won't have the option to run that unless you went to work for like Alabama Power or something like that. You probably wouldn't run into this situation. Uh, or you were in a lot of commercial wiring situations into heavy industry commercial wiring, uh, you might run into having to having to do that. And this is cold spots, by the way, and I thought you'd want to uh, look at that. Uh, and of course, the torch that they swick it down with. These are just different uh, uh, splicing techniques. But what you got to understand, if you have a cable that's made out of multiple labor layers. Then you're going to have to you're going to have to probably get a splicing kit for that cable. Uh, you might have to get it from the from the company that builds the cable. But 3M makes a lot of those splicing kits, and uh, you might be able uh, to get it from them. And this would be on a multi-layer cable. Uh, termination. We looked. Uh, this is uh, where I skipped over a little bit, but uh, solder termination. We've already looked at twist on, crimp on. Uh, what's nice about stranded wire is stranded wire can actually be uh, can be uh, wrapped around the screw. Now, one thing that gives people a lot of problems is when you come up here and you hook your screw. I mean, when you come up here and pre-bend your wire. So what you do is you start off by pre-bending your wire into a hook, and you don't complete the hook. So you just take the wire and, and uh, pre-bend it into a hook. And what you want to do is you never want this to overlap, of course. You want it to go at least 180 degrees. You can go forward. When you hook it, you want to hook it in the direction that you're going to tighten it. Because what you want, don't want to happen when you tighten your screw, if it goes in this direction, it has a tendency to make the wire come out from under the screw. So at least 180 degrees less than 360 so you cannot overlap these things so it's going to be within here you need to wrap it in the direction you want to do it right you understand that if you have some tail if you have something that sticks out like that you want to make sure you take it and push it in so it's up under the screw or the nut and then tighten it down i don't or don't type it tighten it down extremely guys i've seen people get these things and they end up stripping uh, stripping the the, the uh, the bolts out. Now, these are crimp terminals, which you already look at, and this is where the chart's at. So I do have the chart, but I actually have it inside the PowerPoint. Uh, of course, uh, we have different types. We have a spade type, and uh, normally uh, you can buy these uh, in a kit. Um, well, I usually get mine at Harbor Freight, where they come with all different styles: the ring type, the uh, push-on type, and the fork type. In fact, I had to use some of these. Uh, we installed a switch. Uh, we installed some uh, uh, some wheel well lighting in my son's Jeep, and uh, we used uh, this slip on. And the switch, the sw the light switch, basically had the blade had the uh, male blade sticking up there. And so this is what we used uh, to connect the switch. All the stuff that was outside, though, we solder solder splice those. Well, these are ring terminals. Uh, what you got to do, guys, is when you look at these things, you'll notice it's got a uh, it'll, there'll be a groove cut in it, and we'll show y'all that. And we're gonna and when you look at your splice, your splicing tool, one side's gonna have a little nut, a little thing like this coming out of it, and the other side's gonna be flat. But what you want to do is when you splice this thing, you want to put this, you want to put that notch in the ring, you want to put it on the flat side. If you put it on the side right here, when you crimp it down, what is it going to do is it's going to cause it to split apart. And we'll show you all that. 
uh, different crimping tools. Of course, the crimping tools that we're going to use are these right here. Uh, you have specialized crimping tools that we'll look at. I'll show y'all another another uh, slide presentation for crimping. Since we're going to have a lab on crimping, and then uh, different ways that we do it. We have some specialized uh, crimp tools. Uh, when we look at the uh, network cables, uh, we'll look at the crimp tools that we use for those. And also for your telephone, if you could get telephone connectors, you could redo those, and we'll look at those too. Uh, so these are the color of the insulators, and we already went into this, so I got a little ahead of myself because that was just the introduction. So these are the colors right here that we'll run into. So red is anything between 22 and 18, blue is between 16 and 14, and then yellow is between 12 and 10. Now, if you knew the diameter of this wire, you could literally take multiple wires and twist them together uh, in a real nice spiral, and you could crimp these. Uh, so you could take, uh, you know, multiple multiple uh, 14 gauges and twi twist them down, and you might have to use a yellow. Uh, so this is another one. This takes us uh, additional crimp color codes. So, by, by the way, they start repeating. So, what you need to do is you need to look at the size of the thing. So, if you've got a good feel of what your, what your conductors are, uh, if you deal with these a lot, uh, of course, you know, the smaller the conductor, the... Uh, so, we have this yellow right here, and then we have this yellow right here. So odds are when you look at these things, if they're really tiny in yellow, then it's going to be for these gauges right here. And these are the only primary colors we use, guys. So what they do is they they just keep keep reusing the same colors uh, for just a higher gauge. Uh, these are compressions, uh, basically work on the same way. And these are some of your compression tools, by the way, uh, that we'll use. Uh, uh, for our BNC connector, we might let y'all just, uh, we won't probably won't go through the whole technique, but I'll show y'all how we can use a uh, a compression type. Ours is pretty small. Uh, these could be with long handles on them. They could be with also, I've seen actually hydraulic uh, compression tools. Uh, this is just a compression configuration, uh, depending on what type of crimp you have. So basically, these guys right here are just going to be tubes. And depending on which type of crimp you have, it's going to depend on what you end up with. Uh, basically, the crimp tools that we're going to use on our terminals is going to be uh, going to do, put, put in this method right here, which is the indent crimp tool. Uh, these are both on terminals. and uh, uh, These, you can see, they're, they're actually compression terminals, too. We can use these with solid or stranded. They work extremely well with stranded. So we're going to have a screw fitting or an Allen hand, uh, fitting right here. or might be a star uh, that you come in and you tighten this down and it literally compresses. And what's nice about these is that your your uh, stranded conductor has nowhere to go. So uh, we won't change the gauge of uh, which we, uh, this is one reason why we don't, we don't use a, a screw down terminals on stranded wire if we're going to have it. We can, but what we'll have to do is pre-tend the stranded wire to keep it from bird caging if you use it under a, a screw terminal. Uh, using a torque winch, what you need to do is uh, when you get your uh, uh, cr when you get your compression type, you need to check to see what torque is required. Uh, you don't want to under torque it uh, according to the specifications because then the wire might work itself loose. Uh, you don't want to over compress it. Uh, because then you'll probably damage the conductors. Uh, this is called uh, termination using unshielded uh, variations of electric flow. Uh, this is uh, this is uh, what we were talking about 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 equalizing the stress inside these high voltage cables. Because what happens, and we looked at this, would be uh, uh, if we lay this thing against some type of metal, then all the stress would try to move uh, to one side. Uh, so this is why uh, we, when we when you strip these high voltage cables, we don't like to do a vertical strip because of the way the stress lines come out and actually come back. So normally when we do these, uh, this is one thing where we actually use a what we call a stress cone. So you'll see a lot of cables that'll have this special made cone that actually equalizes the stress and makes the stress a lot less. 
Uh, this is another one, which is a capacitive stress. So these guys are literally made of uh, a capacitor, which really, really equalizes stress. And this would be put out on the end. Uh, this you see a lot of these are used on medium and high tension, um, uh, medium voltage transmission lines. You'll see them use these type of uh, uh, stress reducers. Uh, terminal box, uh, we have some of these. I'll show you those. These are used predominantly for uh, for solid wire or we can uh, we can tin our wire or we can use one of these uh, crimp on terminals or solder on terminals uh, either a ring uh, which is very popular what's nice about these is they won't come uh, they won't come uh, have a tendency to slide out but it means if you take them off you have to pull them off uh, you have to pull the whatever you mounted on a lot of people use these uh, which are the spade type. Uh, the only problem with those, if you don't tighten these down correctly, they have a tendency to come off or slide out. But what's nice about those is that uh, you can take them off and on the terminal block uh, without unscrewing the screw completely. If you use a ring, uh, you got a better connection with the ring. Uh, by the way, when you get a ring, you gotta have to make sure you can get these rings with varying inside diameters, uh, depending on what type of uh, bolt or screw that you put these things uh, down on uh, so you don't want to uh, file these things out to make them fit you want to use the right size uh, because if you file them down you're probably going to change the opacity of the uh, of the terminal so these are terminal blocks uh, but you can uh, inside a PLC and, and uh, also a lot of your terminal boards are going to compression type, uh, which uh, they'll have a plate or something inside there, and it's going to be attached to a, maybe a screw or an Allen head screw. And then you got down here, and then this is inside a chamber. And you could put uh, solid wire in here or stranded wire, and when you screw this down, it brings this plate down. These work different ways. I've seen them angle with a flap, and we'll look at those. And more and more of your terminal boards are going to that technique, so you can use. Uh, you don't have to put you don't have to put terminals on them, which makes your termination is going to be a lot faster. Uh, uh, connection to a terminal block. Uh, these are your compression type. These are more and more and more of your terminal boards are going to this type of uh, of terminals that I've noticed. And what you can do is you can put uh, multiple wires inside of here. Or you can put uh, solid wires. You can put stranded wires. And when you when you tighten down on this, this could be an Allen head a wrench. Also, I've seen them use Allen head. Uh, these these guys have nowhere to go. They literally have nowhere to go. Uh, this, by the way, is very popular in uh, in circuit breakers and residential uh, uh, circuit breakers. We're also going to uh, learn how to connect the RJ45. Uh, the RJ45 is used for uh, 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 Ethernet networking. And uh, this is RJ. This is for telephone. Wired telephone, not, uh, not cell phone. And of course, to do this, uh, one thing we're going to have to do is learn how to uh, do uh, these wires are going to be color coded, and you've got to uh, you've got to hook these in the right direction, and then we're going to crimp them on. So this would be a uh, RJ45, which is for eight conductors, and uh, how to use a crimp tool, how to splice them, and all that kind of stuff. That's uh, we're going to look extensively at this. Another method that we have, which is really neat, we call these punch down blocks. And I'll show you a demonstration of this in our next class. But basically, what you do on these, you don't have to strip the wire. So, what they've got is they've got two blades that come up and they're angled at the top. And what you do is you come in here and you put your insulated wire into this. And of course, you've definitely got to use the right gauge wire so the insulator will still be around this thing. 
and then you use a special tool and what you do is you actually lay the wire across there and you put out you uh, in your uh, your crimp terminal I mean your punch down terminal might be in here and then what you do is you take a special tool called a punch down tool and the punch down tool is going to have a blade on it so your blade would be on this side And when you push this thing down, not only does it push it down inside this trough, so when it goes down inside those, the two blades on the inside literally go into, uh, go through the jacket and actually uh, go into the conductor. So it's a really, really reliable connection. And then what the, what the blade will do is it'll automatically cut these things off at the end. So it's really cool. We'll show you those. We have two punch downs that we'll look at. Uh, we have what we call a 110 punch down, which is used for uh, for Ethernet networking. It can take a, a four pair twisted pair cable, which would be eight conductors. And we're going to look at a, a 66 punch down, uh, which is used inside the telephone system. So if you ever saw these big old gray boxes or off color boxes that the phone companies out around and about. Uh, these will have the uh, one one uh, will have the 66 punch downs in. Used to when we had wired before we started using uh, voice over high, uh, voice over IP, uh, they would bring the big cables in that had multiple uh, twisted pair wires in it, and then they would bring it into a punch down, and then the punch down would split it out to the individual phone line, uh, which was pretty neat. Uh, and we still have some of those telecommunication closets around. Uh, I don't know if they still got the punch downs in them or not. It would surprise me if they're not in there, but I wouldn't know. Uh, so this is a 66 punch down. Uh, so you'd bring your big table in on one side, and then you would break it out, and you would do that punch down. We're going to do both a 66 punch down and a 110 punch down. The 110 uh, we're going to do is going to actually be an Ethernet uh, punch down that we would use inside a these boxes. In fact, we might pop uh, one of these boxes off the wall uh, in the lab and uh, take a look and see all the punch down blocks that are in there uh, that the people came in when they installed the, the wall plugs for that. So this is an example of using a punch down. So you have to make sure you put the punch down blade opposite of the wires. Uh, we'll route the cable in on one side and so what we'll do both a 66 punch down and we're also going to do a one a one ten punch down. Uh, later on, we'll look at terminating and splicing a fiber optic cable in uh, the next session. But this basically wraps us up, except for me doing these demonstrations for these different methods of terminating. Of course, we can't do the high voltage terminating and splicing, but we'll do the crimp splices. We've already did the solder splices. We'll put the solder terminals. We'll look at some terminal blocks. We'll do a punch down. And we'll also do a a a, a B and C type punch down with a compression tool. But before we do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and bring up uh, the other PowerPoint uh, that I want to show y'all, uh, which basically is going to uh, not, not there. Really. Uh, so what I'll do is just go back to. And we'll look at the other, uh, the last, the last, absolutely last uh, PowerPoint for copper. These are your uh, crimp on splices. This is a video uh, that I made. I'm not a video, it's a PowerPoint uh, that I made. As soon as the college's network gets along with me. So these are crimp, crimp terminals, uh, terminals, excuse me. So notice here we're tripping off, uh, clipping off about a quarter inch of insulation. Okay. And then if it's uh, stranded, uh, stranded wire, you need to make sure you twist this exposed stranded wire tight. Then we're going to make sure we use the right gauge in our crimp tool. Okay, so uh, and then what we're going to do, you notice this is the round side. So when we look at our terminal, 
what we're going to see is uh, when you look down the tube, and usually it's mounted uh, uh, backwards, by the way. So what I want you to do is look down into this. And, then, uh, and what you're going to see when you look down in there is you're going to see a groove. And that's where they uh, bring the, brought the two pieces of metal together, and it's not soldered anything. So what happens if I was to take this and put it toward that right there, and then I crimped it, then this would spread out. So what you need to do is this is going to go on this side, and then the solid side is going to go into the actual indent uh, crimp, it, uh, crimp itself. But we're going to make sure that we use the right one depending on the gauge wire that we're going to do, right? Everybody okay with that? Uh, I don't. I can't remember if ours is color coded or not. If it's color coded, it's really nice because you know if you got a yellow terminal, you'd put it in a yellow slot, a green terminal, or a blue terminal. Uh, then what we're going to do is when when we put that in, is we want that insulation to touch the barrel. Okay, so touch the barrel, and then we want it to be exposed. And if you take off about a quarter inch. You want this to come out so it's visible on the end, and that way you're insured uh, that it's inside the connector. We don't want the wire to come out in here because if it comes out in here, it's going to try to get under our screw. I want to screw this down. So we want it to be just exposed. I want to see the tip barely come out of the, ba the crimp barrel. Okay. Uh, then what we're going to do is we're going to align it like we said, and then we're going to crimp it down. Right. And then this is what we'll end up having. So that's the indent crimp. Okay, so that's pretty easy. And it's real fast, and it makes a really reliable uh, path. Uh, then we're going to crimp the insulation. A lot of your, uh, a lot of your uh, terminals uh, will actually have an insulation crimp. So we end up with it looking like this. A very, very reliable crimp. Uh, sometimes if I'm gonna, if this is going to be exposed to the atmosphere, I'll come in and solder this too, but that's just um, uh, mine. Another thing that we're going to do is we're going to do what we call a Molex connector, a crimp on Molex connector. And Molex is a name brand. They were the first ones that developed this type of a, a connector, but these are used a lot inside automobiles. So let's see if I can see a Molex connector. So these are these white connectors like this, and you see them used a lot in automobiles. And then we have the male and the female. What we're going to do is we're going to do both one of them. So what we hear, we, we have a special crimp tool. And what we're going to do is this is the insulator crimp. So when you put your wire in there, you're going to make sure that your wire extends, your insulator extends past this clip right here. Then we're going to come over here, and this is going to be your conductor crimp. And then we don't want that to extend into this down here. Okay, We don't want it to get into the actual barrel of the uh, connector itself. So for the, this, while we got this uh, 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 strip, stripped off, is these are uh, eights. This is quarters, so this would be about 316. Okay, I just want to make your 316 insulation. And you notice the way we lay it in. So here's our insulator. Our insulator is going to be in the insulator crimp. Our wire is going to be in the wire crimp or in the conductor crimp. And then we're going to have a special tool made for this. And we got two crimps on it. We got a B and an A, uh, by the way. And then I'm going to come in and I'm going to do the. Now notice, so here's the blaze. This don't show up real good. But this is the blades coming up for the insulator crimp. No, I'm sorry. Now this is for the conductor crimp. We crimp the conductor first. And you can see what's going to happen when we crimp this down. It's going to slide up into here and it's going to loop and close that thing in. So we cut the conductor first. Then what we're going to cramp is we're going to come out and use the other one, the B, and you can actually see the blades here really, really well. And what they're going to do, this is designed when you crimp it down, these guys are going to literally come up here and fold over. And we're going to crimp that down using with the A. 
and we're going to take our Molex connector, we're going to insert it in, and it's going to snap in, and this is what it looks like, and this would be a male connector. Uh, over in our lab, I don't know if I've got a removal tool, but I don't know if you look at the connector. Uh, the connector has got some little wings on these guys right here. So what happens when you look, when you push that thing down in that loop, uh, this guy here is just, it's a little bigger than this. And what happens when you push it down inside the connector, these guys fold in, and then when they get in the other side, they snap out, which makes a really good uh, mechanical connection so the pin can't slide, slide out. And it's a little loose, which means the pins can wiggle a little bit to align themselves uh, with the other uh, the other end of the connector, which is pretty neat. So what we do when we take these things out is we somehow we got to get in here and push these little latches back in. So we have a special tool. Like I said, I'm not sure I brought one over to uh, 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 to the mechatronics lab, but it's, this is the way it looks. And there's a hollow tube. And what you do is you just push it in. What happens is when you push it in, those pull uh, those push those little wings in and allows us to pull the connector out. Uh, if you pull it out, you can force it out, but what you end up doing is either breaking the little wings off or you end up looping them back and then the... Uh, the pin is no good anymore. Uh, this is for a, a, a crimp pins for a, a crimp insert connector. So we looked at a, a solder connector with cups. This is for crimp pins. And, uh, this would be what we call a DB9 connector. And these would be the pins. And of course, what you have is you have a special crimping tool for different types of things. So when you go out and buy uh, these connectors, uh, these crimp on, uh, that have these crimp on pins, you need to make sure you have the right crimp tool. And we don't want to crimp these things with pliers just because, what, like the, like the lady said, is that you're not going to get a good connection. You're going to have air gaps in there. And if you got air gaps and you're going to have corrosion and you've got problems. So make sure you use the right crimp tool for uh, what application you're going to do. Now, this is the BNC connector that I was talking about. Uh, and I'm going to show y'all this. Uh, show y'all this. I was going to show y'all this in class, but these are the coax strippers that we have. Now, when we strip coax, what we're going to end up with is we're going to end up with the outside jacket. And then we're going to have the shield, and then we're going to have an insulator come out, and then we're going to have a pin. So what we have to do, we have to have a stripper that strips all three of the strip these four. And what we have here is this is a coax stripper, and, uh, and what it's got, now I can't see this, but it's got an Allen wrench, and it's got two blades in it, which is going to give us this. I'm sorry, it's going to give us this, and it's going to give us this. And this one, when it strips, it's going to actually come in and. Uh, actually strip off the shield to the right length for us. Uh, this has a gauge on it depending on what, what you're going to do. So this would be for RG58, uh, which we use in networking. This would be the stripper for RG59, uh, uh, which we use in uh, cable TV inside your premise. Notice uh, what we do is we uh, cut, uh, have our cut um, cable we come up here and there's a little plateau out here that we extend it out till it comes up flush uh, then what we do is we take that thing and we spin it around and i'll show y'all uh, this uh, on uh, on video uh, i'll show y'all this in class uh, and it's really neat we spin it around if we got the blades adjusted right and you need to when you get a new one uh, what you need to do is you need to calibrate the thing. It's got an Allen wrench and it's got two Allen wrench holes in there. And then uh, uh, what that'll do is you can adjust the blades till it strips exactly what it's supposed to, you're supposed to be. The coax cable we have is actually uh, is actually stranded, uh, but what they use in uh, what they use in, uh, in cable TV. Uh, so guys, I don't know how far this went back, but I showed y'all the labs, but you can read the labs also. Uh, I don't know how far, how long I had this paused. Uh, the only way I can do it is terminate it and look back at it. 
Uh, but everything, all the slides are up there. You shouldn't have any problem. And anything that we have questions about, I'll show it to you in class on uh, on Tuesday. Hopefully, y'all all be there.